Welcome to Third Academy. Today is one of our Monday mini tutorials. My name is Carly and I'm talking to you about decentralized social networks. So you probably already know what a social network is. We use them a lot in our everyday lives. Social networks are basically like Instagram, Facebook, all of those things. They allow people to join, participate, share content, and engage with other people by creating a profile and then using the platform. So social networks, like I said, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Snapchat, and TikTok are all examples. And these networks operate on communication and information. So the main reason as to why people jump on these is to start communicating with other people. They follow their friends, their family, they promote their own businesses, they create content, and they also share information. So each platform that we're talking about when we talk about these kind of like Web2 or um, centralized social networks, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, all of these own its own databases. So Facebook doesn't share its database with YouTube and YouTube doesn't share its database with Facebook. They each own their own data in terms of their users, the user profiles, the user data that they have collected. These, these platforms right now are not sharing the data across platforms. They own and hold their own data in centralized databases. And in order to keep these platforms free, essentially what they have done is they've developed a business model that is advertising. So they use the user data and they trade that to advertisers so that advertisers pay the platform money to advertise and the advertisers themselves can use the data from each individual to make better advertisements to make sure that people are clicking on the ads and essentially buying things. Here's an example for Instagram. Let's say you're on Instagram. Currently, it's a free platform that you can log on to. You can set up a profile and you can begin connecting with others pretty much immediately. All you really need in order to set up an Instagram account is your email and you need a password and your name, but that's really it. Um, so it's free to get on and use. And since downloading the app and making a profile, your data is now being collected, analyzed, and traded. Let's say you start to like photos of a certain camera. Maybe you want to start making video content. Maybe you want to go out and make, um, maybe you want to go out and start taking photographs of nature, whatever it is, you're looking for a camera and you start liking these photos of a certain camera. What's going to happen is you then are going to be fed ads related to that camera across social media and across websites and basically wherever you are browsing. If you end up clicking on the ad and you buy the camera, what happens is a digital marketing company gets paid a portion of the revenue that you have just paid to the camera company. So once you put that money in to buy the camera, not all of that money actually goes to the camera company a portion of it will go to a digital marketing company that is using your data to feed you ads. And of course, the social platforms get paid for the ads that these companies are running. So every time a digital marketing company or the camera company itself wants to run an ad to sell a camera, they're paying the social platform in order to do that. So TikTok, for example, is able to track your data even when you're not using the app itself by something called a pixel, which is really an embedded tracker that helps target and measure the effectiveness of ads. So when you sign up to these social platforms, they'll ask you to um, like read and agree to certain terms and conditions. Usually people just scroll through and agree because they wanna start using the platform. But if you read it, it does allow many platforms to actually track you outside of you using the app itself. So basically that's, it'll track you when you're using other apps. It'll track you when you are um, maybe like just going places, but you have your phone. So it's looking at where you're going, location data. It will look at what you're browsing online, uh, what things you're looking up, um, keywords, 
that it can use in order to like sell you more things. So it's really tracking almost everything that you're doing. Uh, even when, like, like I said, you're not really on TikTok itself or on another app, uh, which is really interesting. So Jaron Lanier and his colleague, uh, Glenn Weil proposed something called data dignity. And if you're interested in learning more about this, Jaron Lanier actually did a three video series in collaboration with the New York Times, and I will leave the link in the description of this video. It's actually really interesting. Each video is about only four minutes, so if you have 12 minutes, you're going to be able to watch this video series and learn so much more about what's currently happening with your data when you're using social media and the proposed changes maybe that will happen in the future. So Jaron Lanier is a computer scientist, futurist, and he's actually the founder of the field of virtual reality. He's written a lot of books now um, about people's ability to like take back control over their data. He's told people to get off of social media entirely. Um, he's written a book called You Are Not a Gadget and Who Owns the Future? So those books really make you think about what's happening and where the future is going and how we as individuals are actually have a lot of worth going forward in the future because everything is really being um, created through us and our data. So they proposed data dignity, which is really users of social platforms can get paid for their data. Because right now with social media, what you do is you log in, now your data is being used without you getting paid for it and a lot of times without people knowing that that is what's actually taking place unless you read the terms and conditions vigilantly and you actually do some research you're not going to know that all of the kinds of data that's actually being collected on you so social platforms are really getting a good deal by allowing you to use the platform for free. So Jaron and Glenn Weil wrote a paper titled A Blueprint for a Better Digital Society. In the paper, they proposed that users could pay to access social platforms and that social platforms would pay users for their data to achieve a balance. And Jaron said that people could get paid for their data a lot more than they actually think because your data is so valuable. And if you go back to that scenario where you are looking for a camera, you see, you start liking photos, and you, now you're getting fed ads and you buy the camera, essentially what would happen is if you actually did that, or if you are the person that's a content creator posting pictures of the camera and your data is being used, now you can actually get paid for some of that back, which is the proposal. No, that is not happening yet, but this has been something that has been proposed. In a nutshell, the whole of the paper called A Blueprint for a Better Digital Society is that you should own the moral rights to your data because you exist now and forever. So if you want to watch that video series, it's really interesting. I would urge you to actually check it out. And now this is where we get into decentralized social networks. So these social networks hold user data and content on blockchain rather than on centralized servers. For example, we have Lens Protocol, which I'll show you in a minute, and it allows individuals to create social media platforms using the data and user profiles. They also have their own decentralized social media um, where people could create a lens handle and interact on um, lens. So that really means that instead of each social platform having their own centralized server, data is now shared and open. So let's take YouTube and Facebook, for example. Uh, we know that those databases are centralized. They don't share their data, their user profiles, anything with each other. But in this scenario with Lens, what happens is developers can create a social media uh, network or platform using Lens protocol, and they don't have to have their own database. They don't have to go out and build their own database, they can use the database that is already there. So all of the people that have signed up for a Lens handle, everybody that is using Lens now 
that data is shared amongst anybody that's going to build a new social media platform. So yes, we have that data, but it's able to be used across many social platforms and people that are building instead of it being used by one individual centralized um, holder. Um, so decentralized social networks also enable individuals to have more control over their data, their digital identity, and the content that they are creating. And they use non-fungible tokens, um, which can also help to both pay the content creators and the social platform creator to make money. And content can now be minted and sold and or subscribed to via NFTs. So this is Lens protocols mirror mirror is like a publishing platform that allows people to mint their content uh, we talked about it in one of the previous mini tutorials when we were talking about creating um web3 newsletters or web3 blogs or web3 mintable written content so lens protocol says welcome to the future of decentralized social media where you own your own profile your content and your network so this is a big shift from what we saw with centralized social media and Web2, where on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, etc., what we are doing is we are we think that we're building up our social media profiles. We have maybe a thousand followers, ten thousand followers, whatever, but all of that data all of those followers, all of that content that we are putting onto the platforms isn't really ours. As soon as we put it on the platform and it's not ours anymore, they can take all of that away immediately in a minute if they want to. And we see this a lot of the time when people get their accounts banned or taken away, all of their followers disappear, all of that content disappears and it's gone. With something like Lens or when we are talking about uh, decentralized social media on blockchain, all of that data, all of your followers, uh, all of your, your digital identity, the handle that you have, the username that you use, it's all tied to that and it's all going to be there. So it can't be taken away immediately by the platform. And all the content that you put is yours because you are placing it and minting it on blockchain and it's tied to your own digital identity. So that is the shift because we think right now that we have digital identity, um, but it, we, our digital identity is spread across several different platforms and is not really owned by us. It is owned by the platform itself. And this is Lens.xyz, Lens Protocol. They have their developer garden, they have their Discord, and you can actually claim your handle and it'll allow you to then get a Lens profile and to start using their um, decentralized social media. So this is Cointelegraph, and I thought this was also interesting um, for our discussion today. And it says, how did decentralized social networks work? So decentralized social networks use decentralized and transparent data storage. Blockchain brings trust back to the privacy of social networks, thanks to transparent and cryptographic nature. Blockchain-based social networks store data separately between several different independent nodes. Therefore, user data such as profile pictures, information, posts, and interactions are stored in a decentralized manner across the network. They also use smart contracts. Decentralized social networks are powered by smart contracts. The contract code serves as the back end for these social media platforms and characterizes their business logic. Consensus mechanisms. A consensus mechanism such as proof of stake or proof of work is used to validate transactions and enable trust and security in the network. Token economy. A token economy component that powers decentralized social network monetization includes cryptocurrency. It is often used to incentivize social network participants and reward them with tokens for content creators. Decentralized applications or dApps. Many Web3 social networks are available as decentralized applications or support dApps on top of them that offer additional services and functionalities such as payments, NFTs, and more. Secure user authentication. Decentralized social media users, like users of the majority of Web3 services, are identified and authenticated through a secure public key infrastructure.
and censorship resistant mechanisms. Decentralized social media platform users can create and share content on the network without moderation. No centralized third party can censor their expressions and remove or modify their content. The above features work together to create a more secure, transparent, and user-centric social network experience. So hopefully this helped as a very brief introduction to decentralized social networks. And I will leave a number of links in the description of this video to Lens Protocol, to um, Data Dignity, and to other links that might help you to explore these, this idea of decentralized social networks further and start you on your path to education in this realm because it's really interesting how we're seeing this movement from uh, institutional platforms like Facebook and Instagram into other platforms that allow you to have control and ownership over your digital identity, over the content, and over what you do on these platforms with your data. So hopefully this was uh, interesting for you, and I will see you again next Monday.